Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and I do mean everybody, and I know we're going to have many more join us in the moments ahead. Um, I'm Mitchell Warren. Um, I know that may surprise you because the other chair is Vuyaseka Dabula, and you were wondering which one was which. Um, Vuyaseka has a conflict. I hope she'll still come at some point during the session, but in the meantime, I will do my best to um, usher us through the session, which, as you all know, because you chose to be in this room, is about treatment, politics, and financing in 2018. And uh, I don't think we need a 20-second AIDS conference to remind us that treatment is never about the science alone and the politics and financing behind it are what allow us, hopefully, to translate science into reality. And I'm delighted to have five uh, presenters uh, coming up uh, who will have about 10 minutes each to present. Um, we'll take some immediate questions and hopefully we'll have some time at the end um, for some additional conversation on the topic writ large. Um, I'm delighted to start um, with Matt Cavanaugh, who's going to talk about the political economy of HIV treatment policy, work that he's done um, in his role at Georgetown University and the, and the O'Neill Institute, um, where he has been now for a couple of years, in, in addition to being um, a, a leading um, activist and advocate with Health Gap. And delighted to welcome Matt. All right, can we make this go? Success. Um, so thanks everyone for being here and, and I'm going to talk a bit about um, this, this idea of a political economy of HIV treatment policy um, in part because I think HIV is really interesting to think about a variety of health things and in part because I care a lot about HIV treatment policy and so these things come, come well together. Um, this talk was, was done both by myself and also Samya Gupta who is here um, and Kaylin Parrish at the University of Pennsylvania. So, so here's the puzzle, right? I mean, the, the kind of broadest possible way to think about this is that the translation of scientific evidence into policy drives a massive amount of, um, of the difference between, you know, countries that do well and countries that do poorly, so says uh, famed economist Angus Deaton. And yet there are persistent cross-national differences in the policies that govern standard medical treatments. Physicians, WHO, et cetera, often focus on improving scientific evidence, clarifying the interpretations, focusing on dissemination, um, thinking about what, how can we do more effect, cost effectiveness um, analyses, making sure that there are sufficient funding for it, right? And making sure that we can kind of do what's called social learning. But even in addressing all of these factors actually does not explain differences between countries and across countries about who goes fast and who goes slow. So HIV is a clear case in point um, where the, the kind of core question that we'll be looking at today focuses really on this, this point about HIV treatment, um, but as indicative of a variety of pieces within HIV, and as many in the room will, will be well aware and, and well versed, and, and some of whom have been um, deep in the trenches of this fight for years, um, the question of when to start HIV treatment has been a big one back and forth in the scientific literature, but also in the policy literature. First, um, first starting with the idea that you should start late, well, actually, truth be told, first starting with hit hard, hit early, followed by delay treatment until, um, until illness, followed by uh, earlier and earlier evidence that we should start earlier. And so WHO recommendations and, it, and writ large have shifted from 200 CD4 count as the point at which we initiate to 350 to 500 to treat all. And what's interesting about this is that we can actually use this as a benchmark to see, did countries move faster than WHO? Did fun countries move slower than WHO? Did they do all of, you know, which ones did which? and how fast or how slow. HIV is also a, a case in point because the core, um, the core differences that we assume will actually drive differences between countries um, are largely addressed in the HIV response, right? There is a massive effort to, ha to gather evidence, right? Billions have been spent on RCTs to actually test these questions, right? There are huge dissemination and investments in WHO, UNAIDS, an entire UN agency dedicated to this. Funding is at 8.1 billion. If any disease in the world is going to have unanimity when it comes to the core adoption of scientific guidelines across countries, it should be HIV. And yet this is, you know, a year ago, right? So this has changed a bit and WHO has a new slide that they will put up that shows a lot of progress made in 2017. But as of January 2017, here's the diversity, right? So you've got the blue, which is treat all. You've got the green, which is 500. You've got 350 in, in orange and, and below 200, et cetera, in the red. And these differences are pretty significant, right? As we see, see there. So why, why do we have so much of that, right? 
Also worth noting that as we look across countries, some of them shifted very early, some of them took quite a long time. So if you look at the United States adopting test and start in 2012, right, it took till, as of February 2017, five years later, the Philippines was still at 200. So the core question from the political economy literature is how come this is continuing, right? If we have all this dissemination, we have all this work going on, we've got money in the bank that can pay for HIV treatment, why would there still be differences? And there's a variety of theories out there. One is evidence-based medicine, that right? Policymakers just aren't rational, or that are, they're going to act rationally. Those of you who believe in the audience that policymakers tend to act on scientific evidence, please raise your hand. Right? So I'm at a scientific conference. You all know that that's not what's happening, right? So instead, a variety of other political theories about agenda setting that says high prevalence should drive it. Some say democracy should drive faster adoption. Some say just straight up money, GDP, should drive adoption. So what we tried to do was to say, is that true? But then there's a whole other set of theories, which I think actually tend to, um, tend to be indicative of how some of our international agencies act, which is this garbage can model in political science that says essentially policymaking is just messy and we can't possibly predict which countries will do what. And so let's just focus on dissemination. We kind of assumed that neither of those were true. And so we tested it through a variety of things. And so Sonia, who's in the audience, has done an amazing amount of work um, coding the HIV guidelines uh, for 290 published national ART guidelines and extracted the date, extracted the, um, the eligibility criteria, and turned that into a dependent variable that we could put into a model. So we did that and then, you know, you put it into a Cox proportional hazard model, modeling guidelines adoption with a number of different independent variables that test the various political theories about when countries will go fast and slow. And then we also did 25 interviews um, across 12 countries, including countries that were early adopters, late adopters, with high HIV prevalence, with low HIV prevalence, with high per capita, um, per capita expenditure, high and low health system rankings, so that we could get a diversity of folks telling us about how the guidelines were adopted. So here's the analysis, the quantitative analysis, which I'm going to break down in just a moment. But what you see here is that the, on the left are the variables that were significant that crossed the one line, right? And this is a Cox proportional Hazard model, so one is, is kind of status quo. Those on the left are slower, and those on the right are faster. Um, and so what we see, if we kind of look quickly, right, is that you, you see ethnolinguistic fractionalization and veto points, both of which I'm going to talk about in just a moment, are, are pretty significant, right? But democracy barely, HIV prevalence, or sorry, democracy not at all, HIV prevalence just barely, and GDP actually is non-significant in our model. What's interesting here is that the expected factors don't actually have an effect. So the disease burden has a significant effect, but it's tiny, right? So countries with higher HIV prevalence are adopting guidelines a little bit faster. But the difference between South Sudan and Malawi, right, the difference between 27 and 9.2% is 3% faster. This is a tiny, tiny fraction, right? Meanwhile, evidence, and this was kind of from all the qualitative work that we did, there was very little um, uh, difference of opinion within guidelines processes about what the evidence actually said, right? Um, but that wealth, the same, same way, also was non-significant. GDP, if you put in other factors, GDP is insignificant for whether a country is going to adopt a guideline or not. Meanwhile, democracy is also insignificant. So what did matter? And I think this is interesting. First, veto points, right? So a veto point within political science is the individual or collective actor whose agreement is required for change. And the core idea here is how divided is power within a country? The more veto points, the more divided power is. And what we see from, this, from the quantitative piece is that actually more veto points actually result in faster adoption. Now, in some ways, this is massively counterintuitive, right? But if you go from one veto point like Angola or Moldova to six veto points like Denmark or Iraq, what we see is 64% faster adoption, which is counterintuitive because you wouldn't think the more divided power is, the easier it is to make a decision. But if we think about HIV, right, if we think about policymaking, right, which is not about necessarily passing a bill. Nobody passed a bill to change the ART guidelines. But what they did do was that somewhere people living with HIV and HIV HIV clinicians had to have enough power to actually trigger a policy change. And where policy, where power is very centralized, what we find is that it's very hard for countries to actually do basic things like change guidelines, whereas when power is dispersed, right, I live in the United States, Barbara Lee sometimes calls up HHS and says, have you updated the guidelines yet? And they say, yes, 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 we have. One member of Congress can make a big difference on kind of key things there in a way that united government, it's harder to. 
So here's another variable, ethno-linguistic fractionalization, right? And it was significant and, and detrimental. So ethno-linguistic fractionalization is the likelihood that two people chosen at random will be from different ethnic groups. And here, there's a large and significant impact that says if you go from being a low, right, very little diversity to high diversity, it slows down guidelines adoption. And those of us that work in, in HIV politics, this is not surprising at all, right? Like, scapegoating happens all the time. And so this idea that we're going to scapegoat minority groups, and that we're going to scapegoat, and we're going to say this, it's them, not us, is far easier the more diverse society we have. And then finally, just on, to close up, the role of WHO was very interesting, and we did a couple of different pieces here. One was through the interviews, but also we did put aid for HIV, so PEPFAR spending and G Global Fund spending into the model. And what we found is that it was largely non-significant, except in 2017, right? And so in 2017, PEPFAR made it essentially a requirement to move to test and start, and remarkably all of the countries, the PEPFAR countries, moved to test and start. Um, but before that, PEPFAR spending had actually zero effect on, on whether or not countries were going to move. Meanwhile, the qualitative evidence tells us that World Health Organization, at, when we kind of did the interviews, in the North, which will again surprise very few of you, the World Health Organization had very little impact on the North, right? But in the South, it was not, it was not always a driver, but it was often a stop, right? And so how can I tell the Ministry of Finance that we want to do more than the WHO, says one AIDS leader from Swaziland, so that actually one of the drivers, if we think about the politics of this, was that until WHO moved, many countries in the South were not able to. So closing up here, the limitations of this study only covers 108 countries, but that's pretty impressive, I think. Um, and our qualitative data um, you know, kind of tries to make up for some of these, these, uh, these limitations, um, but it's limited to 12 countries. But I think we can take some conclusions from what we found so far. And the idea here is that the institutional political economies of countries is a stronger and more robust predictor of health policy diffusion than either disease burden or national wealth, i.e., to the degree that we're spending lots and lots of time only on evidence dissemination, only on evidence building, and then we're assuming that countries that need guidelines more will adopt them, and that the only barrier to countries adopting those, those best guidelines is actually money, so therefore the PEPFAR and the Global Fund are the answer, we're mistaking something, right? That actually the politics here is systematic, not random, and that actually one of the things that we could do if we're thinking about it is, is WHO and UNAIDS and others that are involved in the process of policy dissemination, if they wanted to, could have a systematic and far more acute political strategy country by country to say, here are the countries that are likely to lag. Here's the kinds of responses we could have. For example, in high, um, highly diverse countries, we need multiple, multiple messengers from different ethnic groups, perhaps, to speed guidelines adoption. Right? In unitary countries, we probably need to actually get higher in the political spectrum to be able to make change, whereas in, in more, diver more um, dispersed policy or power environments, we need less. So the conclusion here is basically that there are kind of many different ways to look at this apple. We can do many further studies to look at what the different drivers are. But the core principle that politics is actually driving HIV policy has been less understood, less focused on, and receives far less attention than it needs to. Thank you. And a shout out to Ruben Granich, who was on the panel, who assembled the very first set of this guideline. So thank you. Great. Actually, Matt, if you want to stand there for a moment. Um, we do have a minute or two for any questions. And as I said, we will come back to the whole panel at the end. But any questions for clarification? Why don't we do microphone five and then two? And Hi. Why don't we them, oh, go ahead. Sorry. And introduce yourself, just, please. Just clarification. Mili Kayongo, USA. Could you clarify the veto power again? Thank you. Idea, the idea of a veto point is how dispersed is power? So, for example, um, in the United States, there is the House and the Senate and the President and the Judiciary, and there might be multiple parties involved in each of those. So how many folks can stop policy change from happening? Right? And so if we think about the difference between many, many different divided powers and we think about the, the king is in charge, that's the kind of core difference. And so, right, there's fewer kings these days, but there are many governments that are very solidly one or two people have to make decisions, and then there are others where many, many people's agreement is needed before policy change can happen. That's the idea of a veto point. And what you would expect would be, of course, that more veto points means policy moves slower. But in fact, if we think about the politics of HIV, more veto points means more sources of power. And if people living with HIV are a minority, 
And if policy change that matters for people living with HIV can be affected by somebody expending just a little bit of really, they care about it a lot, they really want to make that policy change, then having policy more dispersed is going to result in faster policy adoption. And I think that's pretty interesting. Great. Hi, uh, my name is Sarah. I'm from California. Um, and I was just wondering, when you mentioned uh, ethno ethnolinguistic fractionalization, you kind of um, suggested that there's an assumption that that equals ethnic tension and scapegoating, as what you said. Is there any room to kind of see if diversity always means scapegoating and that kind of polarization, I guess? Or is there some way that diversity doesn't have to mean that, and is there a way that we can kind of look at these countries in their specific differences with respect to that diversity? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, a couple of things. One, you know, these are averages, of course, right? And so one of the, the finding here is that the more diverse a country is, the slower it's going to adopt that, adopt, you know, the HIV treatment policy. And that actually fits with a lot of literature that, out there that says that more diverse countries have more challenges in policy coordination, that in fact the blame is far more likely in countries with, with multiple ethnic groups. And we just, we know this from HIV, right? We know that most often minority groups get scapegoated as, you know, they are the ones with HIV, et cetera, and that that causes challenges, right? Some countries have overcome that, and some countries have not, right? And no country has done it brilliantly. Um, but that, that reality, recognizing that reality, that, that multiple, um, that mono, that homogenistic countries have an easier time on policy coordination is actually a really important piece and that it changes how you would do um, policy change. And to me, it changes how WHO, UNAIDS, and others should be thinking about if they're trying to disseminate guidelines. Is the most important thing a longer document with more scientific evidence or is the most important thing thinking about multiple messengers? And I would say the latter. Great, Matt, thank, thank you. you so much. So we're, we're gonna go from global to um, national in Ukraine, and I'm delighted to welcome uh, Sergei Kondratyuk, who's gonna talk about TRIPS flexibility as leverage to improve access to HIV and Hep C medicines in Ukraine. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to the session. Uh, is it presentation on? Oh, 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 okay, sorry. But you can give someone else's presentation if you prefer. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Um, so uh, in my presentation, I will describe briefly how the national level uh, work of civil society organization can and uh, various stakeholders can help influence uh, situation on pricing, uh, especially on monopoly drugs. Uh, so first of all, uh, it should be mentioned that in Ukraine, uh, just like in most of the Eastern Europe and Central Asia regions, there, there persists a uh, significant treatment gap. So we have uh, around 67% treatment gap in HIV and almost 99% uh, people untreated uh, with Hep C. Uh, and uh, back in 2014, when we started work, there was a really uh, complicated and still is situation in Ukraine. There was a war that started in the east of Ukraine and a significant uh, currency, national currency devaluation, around 200%, which caused, uh, caused uh, actual underfunding of the treatment program uh, up to 50%. So we needed to find somewhere ways to provide treatment uh, for 50% of people who were taking drugs, and it was around uh, 40,000 people uh, on H uh, living with HIV. Um, there were various instruments used for that. Uh, First of all, we started uh, communication with patent holders because that's, that's where you have the most uh, chunk of the money going and the highest prices. Uh, generic segment is usually not as uh, money consuming. And uh, we, uh, first we joined some patent litigation, which are very common uh, in Ukraine and in other countries when patent holder just uh, stops any competition when generic company wants to enter. So there were ongoing litigations with some Indian generics uh, uh, on Abakavir. And we entered this litigation and uh, suggested the court to stop it and to permit generic to enter. and just to stop it because we were uh, preparing the patent opposition and invalidation lawsuit on uh, uh, canceling the 
patent of uh, VIV on Abakavir in Ukraine because it's, it obviously was evergreen and secondary patent to us. Um, in parallel with that, we sent the requests. It was multiple times to VIV, FV, MSD, like major uh, suppliers of HIV drugs uh, of, uh, of monopoly positions, uh, asking them to, pri to re reduce pricing, uh, taking into account the dire situation that Ukraine was in and still is, uh, and uh, or asking them to permit generic competition because it was more sustainable way. Uh, for dealing with Ukraine, I would say. Um, after that, as there was no mainly no reaction except for we decided at some point to include Ukraine in Abakavir pediatric license, uh, we uh, gathered a meeting together with the Minister of Health and uh, all four companies, patent holders, uh, Janssen, MSD, Viv, uh, uh, and uh, Abvi. Uh, with national level uh, representatives and some regional level, uh, asking them to look into the situation, showing them the actual number where uh, the treatment gr gap is growing and we are going to meet real, really huge stockouts in the country. And uh, so we suggested, like, what would you do? Like, please uh, reduce prices. Companies, uh, as usual, said, okay, we some of them we provide donations, etc. Uh, but then we requested ministry and we said that we are going to request compulsory license and uh, use of government uh, use uh, provisions in Ukraine uh, on these drugs because we don't see other ways to deal with the situation. Uh, and then situation changed. Um, it happened at the beginning of 2016, that meeting, then we, they said, okay, let's do the follow-up, then there were various meetings, and uh, then we first announced that they uh, ex expand the license on Dolotogravir, and since this great moment, we decided, uh, let's uh, ask them again uh, about Abakavir. So, uh, they decided, when they saw the request, they decided to give a uh, non-enforcement letter. Uh, and uh, which means that uh, any generic manufacturer can enter the market. Same was, uh, same did uh, Mark Sharp and Dome. It's not an advertising of pharmaceutical company, I hope. Uh, but I mean, uh, uh, when they provided such non-enforcement letter after such an advocacy uh, measures, uh, it was, uh, the result was really stunning. Uh, the sustainability of the pro program really improved and uh, uh, yeah, starting from 2017, uh, generic manufacturers could enter Ukrainian market with these positions, with uh, tonoferum amtricetabine and fibrance, uh, abacavir lamivudine, and abacavir. Uh, and prices dropped significantly, so there were drops from around 56 to 87 percent for some position, and uh, it really changed the situation. Um, and uh, just in one year, uh, the country, uh, it was in 2017, didn't, uh, didn't overpay it around uh, almost $14 million, uh, which means in Ukraine we have around $30 million whole treatment program, so it's really a lot of money. Um, and the second case uh, is the case of Sophos Bovir, where, uh, well, well, Request didn't work there <laughs> with Gilead. Uh, so basically, we filed uh, patent oppositions, multiple patent oppositions to applications that Gilead filed in Ukraine. Uh, the access price for Ukraine was really low, I mean, in comparison to US. So it's uh, $1,350 uh, for, for 12 weeks treatment course. Uh, but uh, then, uh, while the patent oppositions were ongoing, Gilead was uh, like, striving to get the monopoly on the market. Uh, there was a, a generic manufacturer who entered the market, the Egyptian one, and uh, uh, temporarily duopoly on the market, dropped the price like uh, twofold. So it went to 700 and Gilead uh, when they managed to convince Ministry of Health and everyone uh, to enforce data exclusivity and got the monopoly on the market. On Sophosbewer, so they said this better access price, $750. But uh, then the story doesn't end there. Uh, so we oppose this, uh, several applications. Uh, Ukraine were 
very lucky because we didn't got this really strong patents on uh, the actual ingredient. They were not applied in Ukraine, uh, so we had applications on secondary patents. And one of the application on crystalline form uh, was uh, contested by us uh, based on uh, absence of novelty, absence of inventive step, which is uh, like usual patentability criteria, especially inventive step where happenings uh, like a loosening of where you give patents uh, for something that don't, doesn't really move uh, science forward. And um, Basically, uh, it's really complicated to conduct patent opposition because a patent examiner should uh, refuse, give preliminary refusals three times to the company before they give final refusal. So for patent examiners, it's easier to grant a patent than just to refuse it. So they were really striving, but they were very happy to get uh, some scientific arguments that we provided them. And uh, finally, they uh, gave a final refusal back in July 2017. And uh, in August 24, 2017, Gilad uh, all of a sudden announced ex extension of license for four countries. As you know, it was uh, Malaysia, I think Morocco, Belarus, and Ukraine, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, such a coincidence, uh, and uh, I believe that the pressure from civil society is really important. Uh, there could be various factors, of course, we don't know what's happening in Greg Alton's head, but <laughs> uh, I think uh, what civil society does is uh, also plays some role. And the price uh, actually dropped because of generic competition to only $60 per whole 12 weeks course, which is really good price for Ukraine being in Europe and uh, like not, not some Asian can't, countries uh, can't access such level of pricing. And uh, with the Clotosphere, which is not patented in, in Ukraine, now we have like $90 per whole 12-week uh, treatment course for basic therapy for HCV, which is very inspiring in terms of how we will be dealing with the epidemic in our country. And all of this goes to uh, transition plans. So Ukraine, just like many other countries, are is in transition from global fund funding to uh, domestic funding. And in that case, you need to, to find most effective solutions in terms of also price reductions because programs should be very sustainable. And the HIV program is now uh, in a better shape except for one drug, which is lopinavirutonavir. Every doesn't move uh, in any direction. Um, and uh, also, at the end of my, uh, not like conclusion, uh, main conclusion uh, is that, uh, as I mentioned, without pressure, uh, there will be very small change. If there will be a strong pressure from the national level and there will be coordination with the government, with the Ministry of Health, which we're supporting uh, us and uh, uh, in fighting uh, with monopolies, then there will be changes and they can be really significant. And also, I wanted to show like a little protest uh, about the conference. There were many uh, topics uh, that were not accepted from Eastern Europe and Central Asia region, uh, especially uh, topics related to treatment gaps that persist in the, uh, our region. And we don't understand why that happened. Uh, and second, uh, we want to call on a uh, situation that uh, Western communities and international community do, do not stay, stay apart from uh, situations that's happening in Russia. Uh, we are very happy that uh, championship, football championships is happening in Moscow and everyone is looking at football why people is dying in the east of Ukraine and it all continues. And now, even before the elections in, in Ukraine, the conflict escalated. And uh, our uh, uh, Ukrainian journalist Alex Ansov was uh, detained deliberately by Russians and he's uh, uh, been detained in prison already for 73 years. And we think such uh, policy should be stopped by Russians and they should stop abusing everyone around, including Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You can see. Questions for Sergei? All right, we will come back to that in the full discussion. Thank you so much. Um, 
We now actually continue with some hepatitis C treatment uh, and turn to Aaron Patillo, who is with the um, U.S. nonprofit Initiative for Medicines Access and Knowledge, and his work focusing there on access to essential medicines. Um, and he's going to be presenting again on uh, America's overspend. <clears throat> Great. Well, thank you all for being here. Good afternoon. Um, I am uh, pleased to be here and present some of the, the recent work that we've done uh, looking at hep C treatment costs, uh, patents, and related access issues in the U.S. Um, so thanks to the program committee for selecting this for an oral abstract. Um, by way of brief introduction, the, the organization IMAC, we're a, we're a small nonprofit um, whose mission is really to make sure that people around the globe get access to essential medicines through ensuring integrity in the patent system. So traditionally, we've been, we've been a small team of, of scientists and lawyers. We've uh, more recently expanded our team to, to include sort of market dynamics and some research investigation capacity that, that I had um, that really helps inform our thinking in real world markets and uh, to help quantify the potential of impact of our, our legal interventions and, and patent challenges. Um, we, we really see that our work in this area is, uh, is a key tool to help civil society uh, affect change and measure impact. Um, I think you, you, what you just heard from Sergey is a, is a prime example of this, and we were, we were honored to be uh, really involved in technical support on those, those cases in Ukraine. Um, so in, in terms of background of what, what sort of led us to this, this current topic I'll be presenting, um, we're obviously here at the, at the AIDS conference. I'm speaking about Hep C. Uh, it's important to know that that about a quarter of the estimated 1.2 million people in the U.S. Uh, living with HIV are also co-infected with Hep C. So that rate is, is quite high. Um, uh, as again, as Sergey sort of gave background on the the cefosfovir-based meds from that Gilead introduced in early 2014. Um, were, were genuine sort of medical breakthroughs and real game changers in the, in the treatment for hep C, um, effective cures for it. And it. Currently, they represent about two-thirds, perhaps a bit less now, of, of all new, new scripts that are written for, uh, for DAAs in the U.S. Um, importantly, though, the, the high price of, of branded uh, cefospavir has, has resulted in, in significant rationing, uh, by payers and, and resulting in limited access for patients in, in the U.S. and other high-income countries around the world, and in particularly in, in middle-income countries, again, as you just heard about. Um, essentially, anywhere where generic cefosbuvir is not available, there have been, have been uh, restricted access and, and cost issues. Um, globally, this was a report from WHO just this year that showed that to date only, only 3 million of the estimated 71 million people living with hep C have actually received uh, DAA treatment thus far. Uh, and, and worldwide, many of the patents on cefosbuvir um, have been identified as, as unmerited and, and are being overturned or not granted in the first place. Again, you heard about the, the specific details of, of Ukraine, but it's important to know this has also happened um, in Argentina, Brazil, and China uh, fairly recently. So it's really a combination of these, these factors and circumstances that led us to want to investigate a bit further the, the real link between patents, price, and access uh, related to cefosbuvir in the U.S. Um, so just briefly on, um, on, on methods, we were basically three main efforts behind this, this analysis. Um, first off, we examined the, the full patent portfolio of, of cefosbuvir. So this, is, this extended far beyond just the Orange Book patents and really included all issued patents as well as currently pending applications. Um, to do this, we have uh, we we really employ legal and technical experts to do thorough reviews and, and really identify markers and and essentially uh, weight each patent in terms of the strength or weakness um, and for what look like spurious spurious patents. 
Um, secondly, we, we to, uh, to, to in order to assess some of the cost impact, we really built out annual revenue models that, that kind of extrapolated pricing um, and some competitive dynamics from, from real world scenarios, really uh, an attempt to look at different uh, different scenarios of accelerated generic product entry into the market and compare those to branded sofosavir. And then lastly, we, uh, we used pharma reported uh, treatment, treatment figures and along with CDC estimates um, to really try to get a snapshot of where uh, the current landscape of patient access to hep C meds in the U.S. is. Um, <clears throat> Our first key finding related to patents here is, is that nearly all of the U.S. patents on sofosbuvir, 26 out of 29 of those granted, uh, are, are secondary or, or follow-up patents. So these are, these are distinct from the base compound itself. You, you heard a little bit, again, from Sergey about um, a crystalline form. That's one example of these type of secondary patents. Uh, that are often sort of trivial, uh, trivial different components of it or processes related to generating these components um, and, and that, that pharma often uses to really uh, extend the patent lifespan of, of their product. So the second key finding was that this on sofosbuvir itself, there are these secondary patents that effectively extend this lifespan nine years from when Sofosbuvir would, would otherwise expire on that base compound patent. And when you consider the existing patent applications on the drug, uh, the, the total lifespan really exceeds over, over 30 years or well beyond the, the standard 20-year time frame that's intended from the, the U.S. PTO. Um, and again, it's many of these secondary patents that are the ones that are being invalidated, uh, again, in, in the, the countries that I mentioned. Our, our second finding really related to related to costs on this. So um, we, we essentially found that there is there's this ten billion dollars in what we call excess costs or, or overspend that's attributed directly to um, the the unmerited patents and the sofosbuvir products for this. So. Uh, in order to assess this, we really looked at the, uh, the period of 2021 to 2034. So uh, in 21, that reflects the earliest time point when a, when a potential generic uh, could enter the U.S. market, of course, pending different legal challenges. Um, and through the, the last point, 2034, when uh, the last sort of uh, existing patent application is on the books and would otherwise expire. So in that period of time, we, you know, we projected that, that Gilead's would earn about $26 billion in that period, um, which conservatively is, is uh, $10 billion more than would be estimated treatment costs for, for treatment regimens that, uh, that would incorporate generic sofosbuvir. So we, we principally assumed that there would be a, a, a sofosbuvir and decladosphere combination, um, but unlike it being available for ninety dollars and, and on pure generic form, we assumed that um, one of the likely the BMS would use this and, and sort of just undercut pricing of the existing marketplace. <clears throat> Again, quite conservative assumptions. I think it's also worth noting that in this time period, which is the uh, which is the, the sort of cumulative time when Gilead's Hep C franchise, though projecting to earn about seventy three billion dollars on their sofosbuvir based Hep C drugs. And uh, our, our third principle finding really related to sort of the access implications of this. So we found that over over eighty five percent of those patients in the U S who have already been diagnosed with, with hep C will, will not get access to treatment this year. Um, so that's about, that represents about half of the estimated 3.5 million patients in the U.S. who have chronic hep C. Um, and, and using sort of historical rates and assumptions about DAA treatment initiation, uh, largely that, that peaked in 2016 at about 250,000 new patients put on treatment. Um, we, we assume that even for this year, if 205,000 patients were put on treatment, that, that only represents about 12% of those, again, who have actually already been diagnosed and identified. So um, a, a pretty uh, abysmal statistic there. Um, 
So in conclusion, I think it's uh, suffice to say that we've, we've sort of identified a, a slew of, of um, unmerited secondary patents on Sylvati uh, that have really created prolonged exclusivity periods that, that prevent the entry of generic product uh, that, that really burden payers in the U.S. with billions of dollars in, in overspend and that, uh, that generate real and significant access problems for, for hep C patients in the, in the U.S. Um, great. Thank you. Thanks so much, Aaron. Questions from the floor? All right. Why don't we move on and we'll catch, catch up with the whole group when we're, when we're through with two more presentations. Uh, next, we'll turn to Ruben Granich. Um, Ruben uh, has 25 plus years of experience, although he's very youthful, uh, in public health working nationally um, at the state and local levels. He's worked with UN agencies, uh, federal agencies, and, uh, uh, and now works uh, as a consultant on a number of issues. Um, and delighted to welcome here to talk about Dalutegravir and universal antiretroviral regimen. Could the good be the enemy of perfect? All right, thanks. Thanks a lot for that nice introduction, and thanks to the organizers for having me. And when we submitted this, um, when we submitted this a long time ago, I thought this would just kind of be a sleeper topic, and that I would be up here making an argument, uh, impassioned argument, or maybe a data-driven argument why dolutegravir should be a preferred first line, and hopefully with WHO and others listening. And that who knew that um, that we would have such a hubbub around dolutegravir. And, um, and so I will, I will present um, a talk here that will uh, make that argument, but also discuss the, sa the recent safety signal. And hopefully I will present something a little bit new. I'm sure you just, you're just tired of this drug, um, but let's go. So background, um, TLD has a universal regimen, safety signal, and conclusion. That's a basic outline, so just hang in there with me. In terms of background, I like to, I like to use this slide to kind of frame things. In terms of the HIV response, we have to work the end of the AIDS problem, basically. And it's a little bit like the Apollo 13 story. The guys were up there 200,000 miles away from Earth. They had, a, they had a, a blowout of their oxygen tank. And then the people on the ground had to actually help them help solve their own problem. Sure, they would have liked a new rocket. They would have liked all these other things. But they had the tools that they had. And they had to actually set clear and shared goals. They couldn't wish for something that was out here. They had to actually use what they had. United leadership, change business as usual, accountability, translation of science. And this is how it, it, it translates into the HIV response. And then failure for them is not an option. And I would suggest that we're all in a similar boat. And our interest in, in TLD and dolutegravir comes from that. What regimens do we have? How can we use them uh, to not fail, basically, or to have success? And again, this is another way of looking at it. This is, you know, this is the crystal ball thing here about what the big five are, and you can substitute whatever you want in there. But TLD for us, uh, you know, a, about eight months ago or 12 months ago was part of that as a universal regimen. This you all know about, 90-90-90. The key point here is that from testing to diagnosis to, to suppression, it's very important to look at that. And then you see 73%. So that's 27% um, of people who are not virally suppressed. That's far too many. That's just basically a floor, not a ceiling. And so here's a little bit closer to the ceiling, which is 95, 95, 95. And this, again, gets you to 86% suppressed, which, again, I would argue is a, is a floor. And we will get to this in many, many countries. Again, keeping TLD in mind, this is the background. What's our treatment gap? Um, and here you can see it. We're at 60% now. We need to get up there to 81%. Uh, of course, this is 2017, so we're going out to 2020 and further out. But we need to remember that all those people that are not on treatment are basically living on borrowed time, and we have to reach them soon. Here, and now looking at policy matters, and we heard Matt's um, nice talk on policy matters. Here we've been tracking test and treat and, and other HIV policies, and thankfully the world's getting, um, getting more blue, as, I guess, as it were. Um, and, and the idea here is that uh, if you publish your policy, we put it in our database, et cetera. And so about 62 countries or 86% of the HIV burden are at test and treat. Now, we're only looking at published policies. Many of them are probably there already but haven't published. Get your countries to please publish their HIV policies. This is very important. Now, turning to TLD. I am not going to talk about the science behind TLD. There's plenty of other talks that do that. But when we were looking at, at, the, at this, none of the all of the science pointed towards TLD, ad TLD adoption. Virological response is faster. TB patients, if you bump the dose, it works. 
adverse events much better than the other um, than the other drug regimens. Pregnancy outcomes at that time were absolutely equivocal. I mean, equivalent. So no problem there, right? And so we also then the next thing we shifted to is to look at. And this is very busy, but I'll just give you the bottom line. We started to say, well, what would the uh, what would the cost savings be if we shifted to this regimen? And we were looking at we we took the PEPFAR countries and we were looking at them and we were projecting forward how many people that PEPFAR would be supporting on treatment between 2018 and 2020. And when I started this analysis with Sonia, um, the cost for TLE was. Uh, was around 132 or something from one of the reports. And so 132 versus 75, and it was looked like we're going to save billions and or hundreds of millions of dollars, and we're very happy about this. But then as uh, the TLE $75 announcement came out, then the, I mean, the yeah, TLD $75 announcement came out, TLE prices started to plummet. So this is a, a 79 to 75 comparison, and you can see we would save about $175 million, which is not chump change. And I would argue that the, T, the TLD prices are probably going to come down further. I don't know about TLE. Uh, so cost savings, but it's not just about the ARVs, right? It's a simplified supply chain. You have this universal regimen that everybody's, almost everybody's on. Um, you have high quality service delivery. You're able to actually extend the, the, let people go for longer with this great drug that has less adverse reactions, reduce costs of illness, death, transmission, and the prevention of drug resistance, which I would argue is almost incalculable. Calculable. You can't put it into a model. It's very, quite difficult to actually know what would happen if all of a sudden we blew our, our, these regimens uh, in terms of uh, our response. So when we, you know, and now I changed the slide now. So good is the enemy of perfect, right? But it's nearly perfect because everything, uh, you know, all these things here, basically TLD is superior. And then the safety and pregnancy uh, issue is there, right? Um, and I'll talk about that in, in a second. Of course, you have to pay attention to forecasting of the manufacturing capacity, and this is how it looked um, a while ago. It's, this, is a, this is an old slide, but you have to think about that. And we were confident that the, uh, that the manufacturers would be able to, and with new um, manufacturers coming on board, that they would be able to actually gear up and meet the demand. And then registration is an issue, and this is, again, very old slide, but we should all be paying attention to this. This is actually a rate-limiting step. Countries need to register this new drug, this new great drug, and, uh, and if, they're, if they're slow, then people will not have access. And so I, I wouldn't look at the details on this, but what I would say is that we should all, this should be in the public domain, hopefully, um, and mapped uh, somewhere and easily available. And here is the adoption, and, and this, again, is an old slide, but the idea being that countries will need to adopt this um, new TLD and uh, regimen in order to use it. And then we, we did a similar analysis um, to what we did with the test and treat, as we looked at which published policies have dolutegravir uh, included in them, and you can see here... Um, that you see here how that looks. Now there's some nuances here, and things have changed since May. But you would you would think that all of the countries would go to a fairly similar recommendation for T TLD, especially now because before WHO hadn't recommended it as a first uh, preferred first line. Now they have clear recommendations on it, so that should help things. Um, and then there was a safety signal, right? So um, our thinking was pretty clear on this. We're working on procurement, all these sorts of things. Um, and the safety signal hit, or I like to call it a danger signal as well, because really it's, it's, um, it's not telling everybody that it's safe, it's telling people that it's, it could be possibly dangerous. So let's just take a little look at that. Now, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to, so you all, I hope you, I assume you all are saturated on the, um, on the, the data around the safety signal, you know, four cases among, uh, four cases among 400 women or, or more now, and these sorts of things. I'm just going to say, I'm going to bring it back to the original slide. We need to keep working this problem. So first, listen to women, do the case series, interview the mom, see, what, um, see whether they had had previous uh, problems, what, whether there were other issues there, improve our surveillance. These are all ongoing, cohorts and observational studies. Calculate the benefits versus risks of not taking TLD for the mother. Don't just focus on the danger signal, but focus on the, um, on the, uh, the potential downsides for the mother, fetus, partners, and other children in that household. Monitor your guidelines and registration process to make sure that the, you know, the world doesn't go completely off track on this great drug. Uh, and then monitor your transition process. How are we doing moving most people from TLE to TLD? Put all that information in the public domain, and that's a, that's a big wish, but um, there's a tendency to hoard and hold on. Release early, if at all possible, and then listen to women. I think I said that before, but I think it's really important because in the end, they're the ones that will actually have to make this really tough decision, or not very tough decision, depending on how you present the information to them and whether they have the full, um, full set of information. 
So, ups, and then I thought, well, okay, if I just leave you all with that, that's not going to be enough. So I thought, all right, put your put your money where your mouth is. Let's look at the upsides and downsides of not taking TLD um, as if you're potentially going to become pregnant. Because the the um, the for everybody else, I'm just I'm we've already talked about that. Let's just talk about upsides um, of not taking TLD. Of, avoid an undivine but possible small risk of neural tube defect in your unborn uh, fetus or child, however you want to phrase that. Uh, so that's clear, that's there, and it's probably, right now it's reducing, it was at 0.94%, now it's down to 06 but it's probably going to be real. I, it's hard to say at this point, but it's going to be there. Then you have to look at the downsides, and I would say that these are easily quantifiable. I didn't do them, but actually you could you could quantify most of these. Lower efficacy with possible illness, death in mother and fetus, and the mother dies, then the other children are at risk. You have to put that, you have to think about that. Longer time to suppression, so that's illness transmission to partner. Lower barrier to resistance and failure, efficacy in face of resistance, so if there's resistance in your community, you've got to think about that. Higher cost for your patients and for your community. Um, and then potential public health downside if fewer people can be treated and if resistance grows. So, you can see my list is long. You could construct this list in a different way, and I think that there will be others that will work on this, et cetera. But keep these things in mind. That that's the frame. Upsides, downside on not using TLD in this sort of situation. And it's a complex calculus. It's heavily influenced by culturally driven values, and that's why you have to listen to people who will be affected by the decision. Um, you should do that just anyway, but that's, that's one of the reasons. So recommendations uh, from our thinking on this and, and including the safety signal, continue the TLD transition. In the end, most I, I believe that it's going to be the universal regimen, first line regimen. Most people will be on it. Um, certainly the men will get access to it. Um, and I say that with a bit of tongue in cheek. The urgently address the policy and registration like why does it take each country to change its guidelines in a different way and the registration has to go country by country, et cetera. That just adds delay. That slows our ability to control the epidemic. Use economies of scale to drive down the $75 price point. That's a ceiling, I would argue, an anchor, unfortunately, on some level, but we can drive that down. Use TLD to simplify high-quality service delivery to reach 95, 95, 95. So start thinking about how we can deliver, and we already are, efficient services to reach that target. Use the available data to calculate upsides and downsides of not taking TLD. So present both sides. Think through. If you're going to do a model, it shouldn't be that hard to do to, to do both sides of that, that equation. And then use this wider division, decision frame regarding TLD risks and benefits to drive your guidelines and then your individual choice. So that was a lot of material, pretty quick. Um, I hope that's okay. And then this is a great shot that I saw of uh, this great city, Amsterdam, which is it's nice to be here. So thank you. Questions for Dr. Granich? Oh, someone was going, but not going to the microphone. Just going for the Don't, didn't mean to make you pause. Super. Ruben, thank you. That was terrific. And in the spirit of one of your slides, um, we're finally going to listen to a woman, which is great, um, uh, after a lot of men. Um, I'm delighted next to welcome up um, Chepkwech Kachat which I hope I pronounced correctly, um, who um, recently graduated with a master's in public health from Emory in Atlanta, Georgia, um, with a concentration in infectious diseases. Um, she is going to present a review of national guidelines in 16 sub-Saharan African countries um, focused on the inclusion of adolescents in the care continuum. Thank you. Great. Welcome. OK. I'd like to thank the conference organizers for allowing me to share the results of this policy review. My name is Chepkwech Charop Kotut, and I'll be presenting on the review of policies guiding the adolescent HIV care continuum in 16 sub-Saharan African countries. I do not have any disclosure. As many of you know and have experienced, adolescence is a very exciting yet vulnerable period because it is characterized with biological growth, psychosocial development, increased peer pressure, responsibilities, and decision making. For an adolescent living with HIV, this vulnerable period becomes even greater because of their unique clinical needs. Globally, approximately 2.1 million adolescents aged 10 to 19 are living with HIV with the majority of them living in sub-Saharan Africa. As you can see on the image to the right, AIDS-related deaths are steadily increasing among adolescents 15 to 19 years old, and it is the second highest cause of death within the subpopulation globally. 
ALHIV include children vertically infected during pregnancy or the breastfeeding period and adolescents infected horizontally. In addition to the developmental, clinical, and psychosocial changes ALHIV face, healthcare workers also face challenges and barriers to provision of services to ALHIV along the HIV care continuum, as many are not comfortable working with adolescents. These factors have led the ALHIV to perform poorly along each step of the HIV care cascade, as seen in this data from a recent MMWR which shows that HIV-infected adolescent girls and young women have low rates of HIV diagnosis in the blue bar, less than 90% of the goal on ART initiation in the green bar, and viral load suppression well below 90% in the purple bar. Recognizing these poor outcomes in adolescents, the 2006 WHO Consolidated Guidelines were the first that identified adolescents as a separate population requiring their own unique services along the HIV care continuum. However, the specific guidance on the unique aspects of care and treatment for adolescents is limited. Countries have also recognized the need for adolescent-targeted policies and services, but there are different stages of inclusion and implementation. Our desk review was developed to assess 16 PEPFAS-supported Sub-Saharan African countries for inclusion of policies and recommendations targeting adolescents within the HIV ART and HIV testing guidelines. The data we collected will be used to facilitate country-to-country -country information sharing and advocate for more policies and recommendations addressing the unique needs of adolescents to ultimately improve adolescent programming at the country level. This was a policy review of publicly available national HIV ART and HIV testing guidelines, and I'll be presenting the results of five thematic areas, which include frequency of HIV testing in sexually active adolescents, sorry, recommended age of full disclosure, age of consent for treatment initiation, frequency of routine viral load in adolescents, recommended age of, from, for, of tra for transition from adolescent to adult services. Information on these five thematic areas were abstracted by two separate authors from the guidelines, entered into a database, and inconsistencies resolved. The data collected was used to, for, was analyzed for inclusion and frequency of recommendations across the country guidelines. As shown on the image to the right, we selected 16 PEPFAS-supported sub-Saharan African countries based on their high HIV prevalence and presence of pediatric and adolescent HIV programs with national guidelines available in English. Overall, Kenya was the only country whose guidelines included all recommendations for the thematic areas assessed. Interestingly, the most frequently included recommendation was frequency of viral load testing, which was in 94% of the guidelines reviewed. The next most frequently included recommendation was frequency of HIV testing in sexually active adolescents and a recommended age of full disclosure age of consent for treatment initiation and recommended age for transition from adolescent to adult services were included in 25% or less of the guidelines reviewed. We present our results al aligning our thematic areas with the UN AIDS 90-90-90. For the first 90, Two of the key components we assessed included frequency of HIV testing in sexually active adolescents and age of full disclosure. WHO does not provide explicit recommendations for frequency of HIV testing in sexually active adolescents. 
This guideline review found that frequency of HIV testing in sexually active adolescents was included in nine country guidelines. Recommendations varied on testing frequency across the countries, with some countries specifying these recommendations were for high-risk adolescents or adolescents from key populations. Six countries recommended annual testing, while one country recommended every six to 12 months, and another country recommended every three to six months. Two countries with annual testing recommended testing every three months for adolescents at high risk. For disclosure of HIV status, WHO recommends that children of school age six to 12 should be told their HIV positive status. This guideline review found that 14 countries included a section on disclosure to children or adolescents, but only eight included a recommended age for full disclosure. This recommended varied across countries. Only one country recommended disclosure to children less than 10 years. In the second 90, the topics we looked at include age of consent for treatment initiation and age for transition from adolescent to adult services. WHO does not provide explicit recommendations for consent for treatment initiation. However, three countries included this in their guidelines and all used the age of 12 years, which matched the age of consent for HIV testing. WHO does not provide explicit recommendations for age for transition from adolescent to adult services. Seven countries included guidance on transitioning adolescent care to adult services in their guidelines, but only four countries recommended an age of transition, which varied from 15 to 20 years and often included a range due to variability in readiness for transition. In the third 90, we looked at the frequency of routine viral load in adolescents. WHO recommends that routine viral load be performed early after initiating ART within six months, at 12 months, and then at least every 12 months to detect treatment failure for all patients on ART regardless of age. 15 countries included a recommendation on frequency of viral load testing, and for eight countries, this recommendation was the same across all age groups, children, adolescents, and adults. Nine countries followed WHO guidance for testing at six and 12 months after ART initiation, and then annually thereafter. Five countries recommended more frequent viral load testing in ALHIV, which is every six months, due to higher rates of virological failure, and Botswana recommended every six month viral load for both adolescents and adults. There are several limitations to this policy review. We only reviewed national ART, HIV, and HIV testing guidelines, and some of these recommendations may have been included in other national guidelines or in internal policy amendments, such as circulars or other supplemental materials, such as job aids, that were separate from national guidelines. The review was also limited to English language guidelines, which excluded several French and Portuguese language guidelines. It is also important to note that just because the guidelines are present doesn't necessarily mean that the services are being implemented. In conclusion, we found a wide variability in national HIV ART guidelines to address the unique needs of ALHIV. With some, with, while some variability is to be expected based on country context, Countries can learn from each other how others have included recommendations on adolescents. We also found that not all guidelines provided guidance on the five thematic areas we reviewed, which could result in healthcare workers not providing those services appropriately or not at all. Therefore, we recommend that more specific guidance should be included in national guidelines 
for healthcare workers to provide appropriate adolescent-friendly HIV services to improve clinical outcomes for ALHIV. I would like to thank Dr. Susan Rabchak and Dr. Molly Rivadinera, who guided and supported me in preparation of this presentation and throughout this policy review. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. You're welcome to stand, or you can sit back and join. And I'm happy to invite questions for that final terrific talk and any other questions or comments that people would like to make. And oh, is there? Let's see if he's coming. <laughs> Good, after good afternoon, John Hassel, AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Thank you very much for a great panel. And hi, Matt. Um, I have a question for Sergey. In your work, in your research, um, how does the middle income country designation for the Ukraine um, affect um, some of your, could you just comment on that, please? Thank you. Uh, just to clarify w what you mean by designation of middle income country. Ah, okay. So basically, yeah, I, I got it. Uh, well, it depends uh, how you look at the situation. On one hand, uh, you can say that, uh, uh, for example, we, when taking decision which countries to include in expansion of the Lotter Review license, they said, well, we expanded to all lower middle income countries. Uh, but then if you look in those countries, four countries that were expanded, many of them are kind of uncomfortable countries. So these countries which like have really strong governments or strong civil societies with governments who won't kind of accept uh, situations where companies is abusing uh, their pricing strategy. Uh, but in general, I think uh, the situation with classification is really unfair. Uh, so for example, what is happening now in Argentina, you know they were uh, reclassified for high income countries of country while they're experiencing significant currency devaluation. And this is basically a first indicator that the population is becoming really like like the incomes are going down and I don't, I don't understand why they were reclassified. So basically, uh, yeah, this system uh, is very, uh, should be reviewed and should be changed accordingly. Great, thanks, Sergey. Other questions? And I'm happy to take them from the panelists themselves. Um, one that I might put to all five of you, because we kind of started and all the way through ended um, with the reality um, that where, where you live matters, um, to state the obvious, um, and particularly thinking about how the diffusion of uh, uh, policies to guidelines to actual, or I mean guidelines to actual national policies to then programs. And I would just love to hear any, all five of you reflect on um, what, what, if anything, might be done practically um, to speed some of that transition up. Ruben? Yeah, you know, I, th I thought a lot about this, and I sometimes I present a slide that shows the polio eradication program, and it shows what the policies look like and when they make a shift. And basically, when in polio eradication, which we're very near, when they make a decision to go from OPV to IPV or these sort of things, they shift, all of the countries shift because they're on an eradication program, and you can't afford to have all these countries doing everything willy-nilly. HIV might be unique in this in this area where we make a recommendation and then countries follow or not. And I think that's I think we need to change the way that that happens. It's just it's just unacceptable for countries to deny access to treatment, for for example, on the basis of something as silly as a CD4 count. Yeah. Anyone else want to reflect on that, Matt? So I, I I think I think that's true, Ruben. But I also think that that's. I think one of the realities of HIV that I think is different, right, is just the, the political realities of a disease that's driven by, you know, who you have sex with, what you shoot up, all those, you know, realities, um, I think does, does lead to a different politics, right? And so I think if, we, if we're serious about thinking through um, uptake of science, right, and we know that science is far more political than HIV because it's tied to all of the kind of social and, and economic drivers of, of inequity, um, then, then actually we need a program of politics to do that, right? And so like the reason I think why, you know, why you see such differences is just how different polio is in terms of like who, you know, who is affected and what's the intervention, 
right? And so if the interventions are quite different and, and far more political and far more tied into the system of, um, of, of the healthcare system writ large, right? That's a very different intervention and, and actually kind of reaching the core questions become who do you reach, how are you able to reach them, who is it that's reaching them, and what kind of choices do they have in front of them. Um, so if the goal is every person living with HIV in the world has access to the most advanced, highest quality standard of care, um, we don't get there by just saying, here's what it should be. We just don't, right? So how do we think about a far more aggressive, this is to me what UNAIDS should be doing far more aggressively, right? Which is thinking through a political strategy that's actually at the national level to kind of drive this. Yeah, but I mean, I know it's not a debate, but I mean, in polio, they- <laughs> No, go ahead, we got time. No, in polio, I mean, look, polio faces very similar challenges in terms of uh, ethno-linguicity and all these sorts of divisions between countries, et cetera, and they tackle that. And the first step is actually set the highest science and then go ahead and work on the political side of things in order so people can have access to the highest science. It's not to uh, it's not to f have a fragmented uh, kaleidoscopic uh, policy environment that that denies people access to the intervention. So I would um, I would argue that that you know something like test and treat uh, we delayed you know maybe ten years on that or five years on that and there was very little reason to do that. But you're saying that's about the science. I, what I'm saying is the adoption of polio versus the adoption of um, of HIV policies, like the actual adoption, right? Regardless of the debates yeah. around who, what, it, what was right and what was not, like actual adoption once WHO says something is true, what you're saying is it's it happens far more quickly. Very rapidly because they're organized about, politically. That's not about, um, about polio being clearer, right? I mean, or it's not about like... No, it's about their political organization, the efforts that they put in to actually have a unified response to, to an epidemic and to eradicate it. We're, we're still in a very disorganized state. That's what I would argue. It's an interesting point, Ruben, because um, on the one hand, you'd say there's huge political commitment. We have UN high-level declarations, and I guess they're, and, and that's very different than in polio, where you have a single agency, the World Health Organization, committing to an eradication program and then having resources committed to it. And I think it, it really does speak to um, the, the level of leadership. And, and I can't remember exactly what the, the, distinct, the um, designation is, but um, I was just talking to Helen Reese about this, who... Uh, um, is in South Africa and, and also very involved in the World Health Organization. And there's a designation of certain diseases at a certain point um, that is, is relatively new, newer than the last 37 years. And, and, and she's argued that if HIV got that distinction, so you look at how, the, you know, the new Ebola response more recently, where people just acted. Ebola, sorry, Ebola's great. I mean, can you imagine if each country tackled Ebola in their own willy-nilly fashion? Yeah. I mean, what a nightmare. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and so it, it, it's, and I think HIV, because it, in many ways, it was the first emergency uh, prepared. And HIV is far more important because it affects far more people. Yeah. You know, I did want to come back, Aaron, to one thing you, you brought up, and I'm curious, um, you know, who pays it really matters. So you describe a $10 billion savings, which is very compelling in the way you've presented it. Um, but, but who's having... If that were really on, I mean, we all know it is on the user eventually. And again, for those who are not in America, um, congratulations. Um, and, um, <laughs> and, and know that our health system um, is um, more fractured than most uh, low and middle income countries in my, my perspective. So we all pay eventually that $10 billion gap that's, that's being spent. But we don't feel it day to day um, because of the insurance structures. And I'm just curious, and I don't know if you can extend it because you were looking just at the U.S. market. but. Um, and whether it's that drug or just drug, drugs generally, it is because the, the, who's paying isn't feeling, or we, we don't, you don't feel it immediately, you don't necessarily jump up and say, we want to save $10 billion, because would we actually, as a consumer, see that? And I wonder if there's a, a, a larger uh, uh, philosophy or message you might derive in terms of, of the, the, the relevance of who's having to pay and then who's making decisions. Yeah, no, I think that's that's a that's a great question. First off, I, I think um, what what comes to mind first is is that in the U.S. in particular, we have you know arguably one of the most opaque and least transparent systems in terms of uh, in terms of actual costs for both products and services in our healthcare system. And I think that's that is you know one of the main main drivers behind. Uh, this idea that that you, as as an end consumer, not only do you not you not actually see or understand what costs are, um, there's you know the incredibly sort of complex payer system be behind all of that. 
uh, th that really just serves to obfuscate the, the, um, this notion of, of who in fact is paying and, and what costs are. So I think, you know, in a, in a lot of ways where you have, when you have instances where, uh, like there are with, with ARVs out, you know, globally and in, in low in, income countries and generics available, uh, and, and where there is a hundred percent transparency and, on, on cost and price, and where the, it's very clear on who who the payer is, uh, I think in a lot of ways that's uh, that's clearly a far simpler a simpler system. Um, and you know, frankly, the U.S. would would benefit from something uh, certainly simplification uh, to a large degree. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Other questions or comments? I mean, I can oh, I can keep going. <laughs> Ruben, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, while he's coming to the mic, I mean, in terms of cost, it's quite, you know, these sort of decisions are huge, right? So the, I presented the 175 million um, cost savings over a three, just a short three year period, but that, that's 1.7 million person lives on treatment, right? So these things, uh, if you just do the crude translation, so these sorts of decisions actually have a great, great deal of cost. Yeah. Go ahead. This is kind of a follow on for the previous set of questions and also our fractured American. Uh, healthcare system. You talked about the secondary patents, but when drugs go off of patents and become generic in the states, they don't seem to fall in cost as quickly as you would expect, and I don't really understand. Mm -hmm. Like in those first couple of years when they go generic, what keeps the cost up? Mm -hmm. Do you want to just quickly introduce yourself? Oh, I'm Jack Hutter. I'm an infectious disease uh, fellow who just graduated. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for the question, Jack. And and, and it is it is an important distinction to make, uh, and and it's one uh, that that I think actually receives a disproportionate amount of attention. Right? This is the uh, the Martin Shkreli's and the the, the, the Dara Prim examples of of drugs that in fact are generic and where prices have been have been uh, you know radically increased in, in a lot of examples. Um, but I think it's important to note that that these are. Certainly, the the small small exceptions rather than the rules, and and what happens and what prevents that is actually, you know, what we talk about and think about is, is what a, a healthy generic market, which effectively means uh, two or more suppliers of a given product. So, you know, it, it's sort of it's sort of economics 101 when you have competition uh, and and genuine competition for. Uh, for 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 sales that, that prices do decrease and they and they've there've been multiple studies that have shown those prices with generics decrease very rapidly and uh, and in relation to the number of suppliers once you get up to sort of above three or four um, it becomes a bit saturated but but when there is healthy generic competition three or more suppliers you'll actually see prices for generics um, drop. Generally, with usually within six months to about by seventy percent, and and beyond that upwards of you know eighty to ninety percent decreases from a, a reference price. So, but the, the the key is really about having generic competition. Great, I did have one quick question for for Chepkwech actually, um, and I'm just curious. You focused on adolescents and the treatment guidelines, and I'm wondering um, if in the analysis there was any sense of of is it the same. Um, variability uh, amongst prevention guidelines for adolescents? Uh, so we did not review prevention um, guidelines, but we did um, assess some preventive um, services while we were reviewing the HIV and ART and HIV testing guidelines. Uh, for example, we did assess uh, sexual and reproductive health variables, and some of them were on contraceptives, like condom use, and we did assess PrEP as well. Um, it's just that we have, we're not going to present the results at now, but we're going to present another time. Great. Well, now that you graduated, you have more time. So you yeah. can <laughs> Fantastic. Because I, I wonder if it, it will be a wider variability, because when one thinks of prevention services and sexual and reproductive health, talking condoms or PrEP or having sex with a young person, I can imagine wider variability, um, often in the negative, um, than even in treatment, which is already challenging enough. So thank you. We look yeah. forward to that analysis. Yeah. Microphone five, Hi. the young woman from, from London. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Uh, she knew a quite from London. I, that just made me think that question about the politics of the pricing of drugs for treatment and prevention. 
And I, I'm sorry I haven't been able to go to all of the sessions, so I'm sorry if someone's talked about this already. But in a high-income country, in the high-income countries of Europe, we can't afford the prices that are set for the treatment drugs for prevention um, because of the way in which the politics of how funding is, is, is determined for treatment and prevention with a much smaller pot for prevention. And I haven't thought about that in the low and middle-income countries. Uh, are, you, are they paying the same price for the drug they use for PrEP that, that they pay for the drug they use for treatment? Because I, I, in none of our models does that work out cost-effective. Great question. Anyone want to? Uh, go ahead. Sorry. So speaking about Ukraine, for example, uh, we have uh, generic Truvada access for some like 10 years or something. But our government uh, is not paying for PrEP uh, because we have treatment gap uh, for basic IRV treatment. And uh, that's why there were so much uh, about price reductions and just keeping getting people who need treatment on enroll. So before they resolve basic problem, they won't consider any PrEP like situation. So now there is some movement into this because, you know, today uh, there were really great news from ECJ who said that uh, Gilead's SPC is, is crap and, uh, and that, that's why we, we can await that generic Truvada will continue to be on the markets of some countries in Europe and in UK and in France. So the situation will improve in the EU, but in our countries we just like Eastern Europe, we just need to resolve first basic treatment gap and put, and then uh, like because it's really complicated to say to the government, hey, let's put some, put out some money for prep while they are striving just to make it continuous and not interrupted treatment for all those and to enroll people on treatment. Now I understand that. What what about Kenya though? Does anybody know? Yeah, so I was just going to say, and I, I will put a shameless plug in for a satellite session that starts in. Um, 40 minutes about prep in practice, some uh, uh, experiences mainly drawing from, from Africa. Um, and people are getting the same, in most of those countries, getting the treatment cost, the treatment price um, in Kenya, South Africa, uh, in Zimbabwe, at least the countries we work in directly, uh, where the low, very relatively low cost generic price of roughly $150 or so for a year of Truvada is the same procured price for prevention. But I think Sergey's point is an important one. Irrespective of the price level, policymakers in many countries um, are still making the argument, and I think it was you, your experience, Sheena, was pretty, pretty uh, relevant in the UK of saying we, we can't do it even at that low price until we meet the treatment gap. So even when the price came down, which, which I think is remarkable, you know, it, it's, it's never low enough, perhaps, but um, when you talk $150 a year for um, a pill that, you know, will protect you pretty remarkably, um, and, and it's still not being made available, um, is, is an important question to be asking. So we didn't have a treatment gap. No, I know. But it had to be exactly, as you say, 80% the price. Yeah, yeah but I mean, $150 is a, is a third more than it or even more, it's twice as much as it costs to treat somebody, Mitchell. So, I mean, that's the consideration there, especially if you have 40% of people that are not in treatment yet. It's a, it's a pretty serious yeah, issue no, no, for policymakers. These, are, these yeah. are huge, huge challenges. Are you going to add something? Yeah. All right, Maxwell Marx from Path for Kenya. Um, I'm just wondering, the two questions I just have for the panelists in terms of your experiences and what we're discussing here today. So a couple of countries have actually moved from different status according to the World Bank, either low middle income or middle income or lower middle income. Anyway, that, you get my drift on that. I'm wondering how the TRIPS and the World Trade Organization negotiations in terms of the new drugs that are coming in to play, especially with PrEP and all these new initiatives we are having, are taking into account and how the local governments are being uh, sensitized to the fact that the drug prices might fluctuate within a period of time given the new change in status. So that's the first question. So I'm wondering if any of you have had an experience. I know in Kenya we just had a low, we just became a low middle income and there's a window given for the country to be actually purchasing drugs at a certain price. So I'm wondering if that is something that is being taken into account. Is it an assumption in some of your studies? And if, if not, what are your thoughts on it? The second part of this is looking at men and the cost of actually 
putting men on treatment aside from the drugs themselves. So I'm wondering if there's any implications based on your experiences where you could actually see any variations or key issues that we might be missing out on in terms of costing what it would actually take to get men to access treatment, again, in line in terms of the different regimens that they have. Great, great questions. Anyone want to take either or both? The men I'll tackle. Okay. But maybe you get the trips, huh? Yeah. I'll, I'll just make a, a, a brief comment on the, on the first one, which I think is a great point that you raised. And there, there have been um, a number of examples of countries that have, uh, that have changed in income classification, whether you're looking at largely at World Bank classifications. Um, and some that not only, you know, the, of course, the general trend is that they're, they're increasing going sort of up, up the ladder, but there are multiple examples of, of countries that have been uh, reclassified, a bit like Sergey talked about and with, with Ukraine, and sort of flip-flop back and forth, even in, in multiple consecutive years. So uh, I, I think it's, it's a great point and a concern to raise. I, as far as I know, aside from some provisions for allowing you know, a, a bit of a transition period, it, it really is, though, a, a snapshot in time and one that um, more or less dictates what, what pricing a lot, of, a lot of countries get for, uh, for drugs and, and diagnostics. Great. Ruben. So, yeah, and the, the men question is quite good. It's, it's excellent. You know, the, thing, the funny thing about men is that they're, I guess they're weak compared to the women. The women are able to wait for three hours for, the, for these services that are just not there, that are very slow and all these things. And men, they just can't be bothered, okay? So if, I think the answer is to improve, obviously improve the services. But something like TLD, which actually allows you to not, not have to come in as frequently, you have less side effects and these sort of things, has to help these, I'm going to just, I'm joking here, these weaker men to stay on their, stay on their regiments. And that's the same as same-day uh, provision. You know, don't make the men come back. Don't make the women come back either. Give them the drug immediately. And then uh, give people HIV self-test so they don't need to, uh, you know, come into these, uh, these clinics. But improve the services, but, and TLD is part of that. So I, and it, it's easily costable. The, the cost of not having men on treatment is enormous. Okay. And I mean, and then just to say on, on, on the kind of question around which countries are included and which countries are not, especially in kind of a set of the voluntary licenses, I mean, it's just worth knowing that these are massively political themselves, apropos of the, of the, of the title here, right? That they, the, which countries are eligible for which voluntary licenses does not break down, um, along income, uh, designation lines. Uh, it largely breaks down on, on which, com which countries must be in a voluntary license for it to seem legitimate to the outside world. Um, and so you see these shifts, right, where when, when things get political enough, where a country threatens to use any sort of uh, element of the TRIPS flexibilities, then all of a sudden they are largely added to the, to the list. And so one of the things that if we're actually going to get serious about ensuring that middle-income countries have access um, is to see far more and far wider use of the various TRIPS flexibilities, because we know that that's what triggers either the use of the trip flexibilities and then the introduction of generics or a price reduction that's far more substantial than for those countries that have not. And where countries have really ceded that ground, um, that's where we're seeing the highest prices among middle-income countries. So it's going to be a huge issue going forward, um, including likely for new drugs in middle-income countries in Africa if the politics don't shift. Yeah, that's great. Well, it's not great if they don't shift, but it's great that you made the point. Um, that is a terrific place to end, I think, as we draw to the top of the hour. Um, I want to thank all five of you. Unless you have any last words that you'd like to impart for the, for the evening? No. All right. Thank you all very, very much, and um, thanks for your great presentations. <laughs>